This is Christian Bylard and David Negretti, and we're talking about two images that are both surprisingly about hell. And both of these works are represented physically in a different way, uh, one an oil painting and the other a plastic cast. Let's jump into the first one, the painting, the oil painting. Now, who's the artist? Uh, this is an American art piece done by Edward Hopper in the year 1942. Um, it was one of Hopper's most famous paintings, most likely due to the ambiguity and mysteriousness of the image, um, along with its stark contrast of light and dark. It has been referenced in media such as That So 70 Show, The Simpsons, and has also been included in several pieces of literature. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about the time period. Okay, um, a little bit about the time encompassing this piece. Uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred a little over a year before the painting's completion date. Okay. Um, and the painting was uh, completed in the middle of the Second World War, um, where many were overseas and uh, leaving us with this feeling of isolation and loneliness, as we see in this work. Oh, okay. Now, mm -hmm. the diner in this painting, did this actually exist? Um, we don't know for sure. Uh, there's been a lot of people that have tried to look for this diner, inspired by an actual diner in uh, Greenwich Village, um, uh, Hopper's neighborhood in New York. Is there an actual diner named Phillies? Um, there probably is out there, but uh, as we can see in the top of this image, that Phillies is not the name of the diner, but in fact a brand of cigars. Uh, you can see it up there in the top left, five oh. cents. <laughs> okay, I see what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anything special about the figures now? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, the man and woman uh, sitting together there are modeled by Hopper and uh, his wife. Um, uh, his wife's name is Joe, and uh, Joe was more emotionally involved with Hopper than uh, he was with her. And one way she continued to stay with him was uh, to be his only female model. Oh, wow. All right, now tell me a little bit about the lighting in this image. Uh, yes, um, we're attracted to this brightly lit diner um, that uh, dimly lights its immediate surroundings. Uh, the openness and brightness of the work exposes the figures in the building, um, giving us a sense of vulnerability and lack of privacy. All right, now how would you compare this diner to, say, the diner across the street in the image? Oh, okay. So uh, take a look at the cash register across the street. And, okay. Uh, it sort of suggests that the, a family business that has been in operation for a number of years and has been successful enough not to feel the need to modernize uh, its business, like the diner we see. Um, we notice the fluorescent lighting in the diner, which uh, didn't exist till around the early 1940s. All right. Wendy Beckett states that the lonely cash register suggests a family business that has been in operation for a number of years and has been successful enough not to feel the need to modernize the store in order to keep customers. Is there anything interesting about our point of view? Uh, yes. Uh, we see that the diner is located on a sharp-angled street corner, uh, which allowed Hopper to enhance our perspective of this work. It gives us a view of the street behind the What's customers. What's interesting about the diner is that the Hopper the large glass window that covers most of the canvas from our point of view, uh, which he states wasn't his intention. This now separates the viewer from the figures by only a large glass window, again leading to this feeling of isolation and entrapment. Right, I was kind of wondering how they got into the place. Now, my questions are, what are these three figures doing here so late at night, and what exactly are they talking about? All good questions, and all questions that I had too when I looked at this, this piece. Um, there's been several books written that tried to explore answers to these questions, but uh, it's still unclear, and open to interpretation. Now, I probably should have asked this at the beginning, but why the title Nighthawks? <laughs> well, uh, when you hear the word Nighthawks, you think of birds, and uh, the funny thing is that there's no birds in this work. When you look closer at each of the figures, uh, they amazingly appear to be hawk-like, with their black eyes. And from our point of view, we kind of become a Nighthawk, um, separated from the community. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention was uh, the worker in the diner. Uh, we notice that this counter sort of surrounds him and uh, traps him within the middle of the building. Um, in a book by Gordon Thiessen, uh, the story of this man is that he's in fact a free man uh, with a job and a home, and uh, it's the customers in the diner who are the actual Nighthawks. Alright, so what is your overall view or meaning of this? Okay, so again, back to the title of the work, uh, Nighthawks. Night Nighthawks are birds of prey. Um, again, there were no birds in this painting, so we, be we begin to look at it as a metaphor. Uh, these people are the Nighthawks up so late, in so late at night. So what is actually being preyed upon in this setting? Is it men preying on women, or women preying on men? Or perhaps there is no preying, but instead only misery and separation of these figures from the community. Perhaps they desire to be set free from this diner, like a wild bird in a cage. Alright, very interesting. I kind of see this, the emptiness within the picture, 
as the calm before the storm, they're waiting for something. This is almost like a waiting room for hell. I also see the man sitting there by himself as someone who's contemplating their life. Well, you have the other figures who have just kind of accepted their fate and are waiting for something to happen. Ah, fascinating points you have there. Uh, I didn't look at it in that way. Uh, that leads us to our next work. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the next work, Christian? Right. This is a plastic cast. This is Auguste Rodin's The Gates of Hell. Now, this was commissioned in 1880 by the French government. So, we've seen quite a few doorways or portals made for church doors already. What's so special about this one? This one's special is because this was made for a secular building. This was supposed to house the Musée des Arts Décoratifs, but this building was never actually built. Mm hmm So what exactly is that? The Musée was uh, supposed to be a building that was supposed to house a bunch of artwork, you know, it wasn't necessarily secular or part of any academy necessarily. Also, another interesting fact about this is that he was given the choice what the subject was to be on the door. This is important because many commissions were done by the church, which were very strict, and even private parties usually want something specific when they are done. The fact that he was given the ability to do this himself was amazing at the time. Interesting. So what led to this incorporation of Dante's story? Right. So Rodin had been um, engulfed in the story, and he had spent a whole year you know, just reading the, the play and making his own drawings of what he perceived Dante and Virgil and all the figures in the gates of hell as. There's this great quote from the book Rodin by Elson, which is Rodin talking himself about Dante. He says, I had a great admiration for Dante. I spent a whole year with Dante drawing the eight circles of hell. Hmm, cool, cool. So uh, could you tell me a little bit about some of the figures that stand out? Right, so at the very top of the cast, we have the three shades of Adam. Now, these weren't necessarily a part of the story, but they were just so iconic that Rodin had to put them in. We also have the figure Ugolino, who is from Greek mythology, and we also have the two lovers, Paolo and Francesca, over there on the side of the cast. Wow, this is just an amazing piece. Uh, how long did it take him to finish this? Now, he started this in 1880, but when he died, this work wasn't completely finished. Hmm. Someone went into his studio and found the pieces just sitting there. The molds ready to be casted, but nothing actually in them. Ah, okay. So uh, how is its present condition? Well, we see it mostly in bronze today. I actually got a chance to see it on the Stanford uh, University grounds ah. in its bronze cast. And it was outside, and it was a glorious image. Ah, okay. So uh, very cool. You got to actually see this work. Um, how do you think it's spiritually significant? Well, Rodin devoted much of his life to making monuments for the dead, and I see this as not only a, a monument to the divine comedy, but also to us, or the dying of the soul. This figure is so spiritual to me because, again, it has that sense of emptiness that we saw also in the Nighthawks. There's this open space, there's kind of this ocean I see of flames, and the figures mm -hmm. coming out, you know, some being pulled back in. Mm -hmm. And it kind of creates this spiritual vacuum. And because of those figures coming out of the portal, that made this architecturally just groundbreaking because there's the whole 2D of the Renaissance and Rodin just completely threw, threw everything away he knew and just went straight out of his brain. While he was making his um, portal door, mm. he made some of these images by themselves as standalone statues, which is ah. amazing as is. These were kind of blown up images mm -hmm. of certain figures in the piece by themselves. Well, Christian, I didn't see how uh, we were going to connect these two works, but, but now that you've expressed how you feel, i got to say I agree, and I do see a slight connection between the two. Well, now that you, the viewer, have listened to our opinions, this is ultimately up to you. What do you take from this?